been 400 years since God had spoken directly to the Israelites. Then, one day, God sent an angel to a girl named Mary, who was engaged to a man named Joseph. The angel told Mary that she would soon become pregnant and give birth to a son named Jesus. He would be great, and God would give him the throne of his ancestor David, and his kingdom would never end. But Mary was a virgin, and this confused her. So the angel told her it would be by God's power that she became pregnant. When Mary's fiance Joseph heard about this, he decided he would quietly end the engagement. But an angel visited Joseph as well, telling him not to be afraid, and that Jesus would save people from their sins. So Joseph and Mary decided to get married. Soon after, they traveled to the town of Bethlehem. Because so many other people were in town, there was no place for them to stay, so they slept in a manger. While they were there, Mary gave birth to her son, wrapped him in cloths, and laid him in the manger. There were shepherds living in the fields nearby. While they were watching their sheep, an angel appeared to them announcing that a boy had been born in Bethlehem. This boy, said the angel, was the Messiah, the king that the Israelites had been waiting for. So the shepherds left their sheep and raced to Bethlehem, finding Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the manger. The shepherds praised God for their new king. During this time, the country of Rome controlled all of Israel. After hearing about Jesus' birth, a group of magicians and astrologers came to Herod, a governor working for the Roman Empire. They claimed that they had seen a star in the sky, telling them that the king of the Israelites, now called Jews, had been born. This news really upset Herod. He gathered all the priests and teachers and asked them where the ancient prophets predicted the king of the Jews would be born. When they arrived in Bethlehem and met Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, they felt great joy. Herod was furious and commanded that all boys in Bethlehem who were two years old and younger be killed. But God had already warned Joseph, who by that time had moved his family to Egypt to hide. Later, after King Herod died, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus moved back to Israel to a small town named Nazareth. They stayed in Nazareth for years, raising Jesus. When he was 12, they traveled to Jerusalem for a festival. When the festival ended, Joseph and Mary left for home with a large group of people. But Jesus stayed behind without them knowing. When they realized he was missing, they went back to Jerusalem and found Jesus sitting in the temple, listening to the teachers and asking them questions. His parents were upset and couldn't understand why he had stayed behind. Jesus told them, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Joseph and Mary didn't know what he meant. They did not yet fully understand the importance of who Jesus was and all he would do. So this story of the birth of, of the Christ, you guys heard that story before? <laughs> I think so. You know, I, I, I thought that would be a funny thing to say. <clears throat> and, and then, you know, the truth is, your friends, your young friends, there are a lot of people who don't know that story. You know, I, it, it's, it's it, 20 years ago, everybody knew the story. But, you know, they, they don't know the story anymore. I think we need to be prepared to tell the story again and to tell it Tell it briefly, but I, I think we just cannot assume people know basic stuff that every, even though they're out celebrating Christmas and singing the Christmas carols and buying the presents, don't assume that. It's, it's, a, it's a very different world than it was just, just 20 years ago, which wasn't that long ago for those of us who were older than 21, Stuart. <laughs> hey, I want to talk tonight about Mary. Very Catholic-looking picture, isn't it? 
Mary is not a Catholic monopoly. And I know that a, num a number of uh, people have really kind of come to that conclusion. I, I think, and I, wanna, I have to check this, but I think Luther's church was St. Mary's church. Do you know that? So there, there aren't a lot of St. Mary Lutheran churches, but there are a few. So I want to talk to you a few minutes about what about Mary's role in, uh, in, in this whole thing. Isaiah foretold that the Messiah would be born of a virgin and she would be a descendant of David. And both of those things were, were true in Mary, hundreds of 600 years before. Early in Jesus' ministry, there was not a lot of attention paid to Mary. But discussions began to grow over the years. And the, the first time a group began to talk about Mary differently than another group was, was in the East, and in, in Greece, and the Orthodox, what became the Orthodox churches, and they began to talk about Mary being the Theotokos, the, the mother of God. That was a kind of a big debate. And the churches pretty much embraced, yeah, okay, that is true. She is actually the, the mother of God. So then she began to be talked about more, more importantly, there began to be more holidays that involved her and such. And then we had this little event in Germany called the Reformation. And there began to be more substantial discussions leading up to this time about who Mary was. There, there began to be a lot more rationalism and intellectualism in, in Christianity. And they began talking about some more theological issues more broadly people. And then this, this, this uh, Reformation happened, and then, then they became very emotional. Because the, the Reformation was kind of a big deal. After that, there was the Thirty Years' War, where eight million people were killed because of the Protestants fighting the Catholics, and it was really an ugly thing. And then during the Reformation, there's this big debate about the Pope, right? Who's the Pope to come in here and tell us? So in England, they said, forget you, Pope. We're going to keep your stuff, and you can have, we're going to keep our bishops. We can have all the, and they broke off. They just became the, essentially the Roman Church without any, any need to acknowledge the Pope's authority. In Germany, they didn't like him coming over the Alps and telling them what to do, so they, they protested and became the Protestants. So the, 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 the churches became very emotionally separate for emotional reasons and very severe reasons. And by the time uh, the, the, the Reformation was done, uh, there was just this big divide. You can see the orange is kind of the, the Catholic presence. No. Uh, well, there, there was the Catholic presence, which is orange. And, Anglicans, which were on their own, and then the purple and pink were, were, uh, were Protestants. So it was really a very divided world. Went from being very unified to very, very divided. So it was in the middle of this, this, this period that there began to be this discussion, this serious discussion, about if Jesus was born with no sin, and he came from Mary, and his DNA was carried by Mary, and Mary had original sin in her, how does that transmit to Jesus? Who, any of you grew up Catholic? Been through these discussions? You did, okay. So is this a familiar discussion with, yeah. with you? <clears throat> so today we have this conflict still in our, it's still a discussion okay, where Protestants and Catholics disagree. So when I say what is the, the idea of, what, what is the concept, what is the, the dogma of immaculate conception, what does that mean? can't answer. Mary? That, that Jesus was born without, there was a Holy Spirit planted him. So immaculate conception has to do with Jesus being born wrong. Yeah, Mary's answer is the answer that all my seminary buddies gave because none of them do. So you're in good company, Mary. You go to seminary now. Okay. <laughs> but you're right that it has to do with 
Mary having no sin. And so there's this big debate about was Mary totally sinless so that she could pass on her DNA to Jesus and not give him sin? And was that total sin forgiven when she was born or when she was conceived? Or, I mean, there's this whole humongous, it's called Mariology. And, and the whole idea of if Mary is sinless, then is she, is she somebody we should pray to and ask to redeem us, ask to take our sins away? So there's this, this whole, whole stuff of, of what's called Mariology in the Catholic Church. It's just very different than, than Protestant understandings. And that's caused, in some cases, Mary to be truly, way venerated. People, people pray to the saints, and they certainly pray to Mary because she is this super holy person. So why, why, is, why, why has Mary gone from being somebody who was one of the people around Jesus to be in this, this super holy, super, super uh, venerated woman. Well, one of the reasons is the development of understanding of Jesus. If we look, go back to the catacombs, this is a picture painted in the, the Roman catacombs from the early days of Jesus. What do you see there? <laughs> Can you see that? I don't know what that is. Did you hear this? It's a it's a lamb on the show. It's a chicken a chicken lamb. Chicken lamb. Yeah, it's that was the best picture I could find. So so we have a picture of uh, and who carries lambs on their shoulders? Jesus. Thank you, Jen. That's very well, Shepherds, right? So here we have Jesus as the shepherd. <clears throat> Caring for his flock, caring for his, his animals. Yeah. By the 12th century, we see mosaics. I'm not, I'm not going to pay attention to you, Stuart. <laughs> now, by, by the 12th century, we see uh, we see mosaics in uh, in antiquity that depict Jesus much more, uh, much much less pastorally. He looks he looks kind of like a pastor or a caretaker or a priest or you know, and by, by the Reformation, we see this. What do you see? And what's the difference there? Kings and crowns. Kings and crowns and authority, and I'm going to kick your tail if you, 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 you violate my law. Yeah, there's a bazillion pictures like this. So Jesus has gone from being the pastor who picks up the lamb to be in the, the king that's going to kick your tail if you if you uh, if you don't. so so Jesus becomes unapproachable. So how do we get Jesus to hear our prayers? Say them. Say them. Say them. Say them. Uh, uh, we talk to his mom. We talk to his mom. Because she's tender hearted and she's got connections and he, he loves his mom. So we talk so that's really so that's what so that's where this Mariology, that's where this the accessibility of, of Mary, because Jesus is not accessible, comes from. She is Luther citing there's a mystery the mystery of Okay, now this this is a great point. That, did I pay you to say that? <laughs> this is a great point. This is this is something that they had to kind of recognize in the Reformation, and Luther was good at this. Is the Catholic Church had been buying into this whole rationalism, scientific revolution, and it, that everything can be figured out, and so they 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 were were, were coming up with the with the logical explanations and imposing them on their theology. Whereas Luther would say, because Luther said, did say all the stuff of the Catholic Church, but once he dug, dug into the, the scriptures more deeply, he, he said, you know what, this is a mystery. We, we just don't really understand this, and we can't understand it. 
Yeah, so, so th this, this is a departure, this, this rationalism versus the mystery, and this is the point where, where Lutheranism really has, has kind of distinguished itself so far. There are other reasons to, to reject the Catholic Church's positions, and they're because they're the Catholics and we're the not Catholics. They're the Catholics and we're the protesters. They're the Romans and we're the Protestants. And so that, that was a so, so that was another reason, but we were kind of in the middle for theological reasons and, and for this, this one of these reasons. Thank you. Wouldn't, them, uh, wouldn't that be kind of like worshiping another god if they're going through Mary? Oh, my goodness, yes. This is a big issue, is, is what we have done, or what, what, what the early theologians, what the Protestant theologians have really talked about, is, is the idolatry of moving Mary up to the position of Jesus. It's very insightful. Yes, this is one of the big problems the non-Catholic Mariologists have with, with what they with, with what this this whole theology of Mary talks about is it's very idolatrous. But then I will say that the Protestants I think have done a, a job that the evangelicals with with reinventing Jesus in their own image in their own way. We see a little bit of that in this this picture here. We, <laughs> But the, the real issue, uh, the real issue, I think, is that we need to major in the majors, as my kids would hear me say. We need to, to, we need to look at who Jesus is in Scripture and recognize that we see him at different times in different ways and different denominations see different uh, understanding of him, and we all have an incomplete understanding. And that standing at, with valuing Mary does not align you with the Catholic Church. Making her a, 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 like Jesus, that, that's a we don't see that in Scripture. Much of, most of us don't see that in Scripture. But we need to see who Jesus is as uh, coming from Scripture. But in the end, the words we need to live by are St. Augustine's, who said, in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. We need to recognize we are going to disagree and be charitable in that disagreement. Any questions before we start Randy Frazee's uh, video? Yes, you, you, to, to go, yeah, and the Catholics will tend to have a favorite saint and they'll pray to them, and it's, yeah, go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not just, it's, I mean, the Mariology is really strong, but it's also all the this, this saints for every occasion, yeah. right? Yeah. And, um, that, I mean, I've been, I've been, I've been coming to a Lutheran church for 20 years now, so I, you know, I, this is one of the things that actually made me switch, which is really interesting. I, I agree. Um, but it's, um, the, I, when I was a kid, I went to Anglican Church and Catholic Church on the same Sunday for, for very interesting reasons. I was singing in a choir in one, I was multiple in the other, but um, I went to a Catholic school and what I ended up having, I ended up having disagreements because we get to all theology there. Um, I ended up having a lot of disagreements about this particular point. I remember one of the, about the discrepancy between the Bible, biblical teachings and the church's teachings, teachings was that's just the way it is. You know, and that was the moment for me when we switched, but I always, yeah. it's, it's the, the it's every occasion there is a different saint you can go to. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, I said, I mean, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that I, I kind of caught on to very early on when I, when I uh, joined the Lutheran Church was more about the, yes, there are, they are saints, but they are now with Jesus. They are not in front of Jesus. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Luther said, Mary would have, rather have you pray through her than to her. And I think that's exactly what Luther was saying. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, Pastor, a friend of ours a long time ago did mention, though, that if you ever want to get anything done, put a Jewish mother to work to make another <laughs> son. <laughs> she, she had one question, too, though. In what yeah. we read this last, no, we are safe. In what we read this last week, uh, one of the things listed, uh, the, the entire genealogy of Jesus, from Abraham all the way down to Joseph. But Joseph wasn't yeah, okay, so the genealogy you read is, is from Abraham to Joseph, and that's because it's based on the book of, uh, let me help me, Luke, Luke, Luke and Matthew, I think, too. There's a genealogy through Joseph, and there's a gene genealogy through Mary. Oh, okay. The one they listed was through Joseph. Yeah. yeah. And, how, and how long ago, this is an interesting stat for you, though. I don't know, you might find it interesting. The... The number of years you have to go back to find a single common ancestor is about uh, 1,800 years. 1,800 years for a common ancestor, yeah. wow. So wow, all of those that you go back, that, I mean, all of them in the world can trace back to, it's actually multiple common ancestors because of the exponential growth of the population. But it's about that same time. So essentially, if you can think about it, I think that means that um, everybody could trace. Everybody can trace themselves back to yeah, David. Yeah. I mean, how would David do that? Yeah. Yeah, the Mormons do do that. Okay. Yes. They, 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 they take themselves all the way back to Adam. Yeah. Well, good. Well, hey, let's uh, let's watch Frank Christie. When I was a youngster, my father went away on a business trip for three months. Three months is a long time for a ten-year-old boy. What I remember most of all is not the time my father was away, but I specifically remember how things changed when he returned home. The whole atmosphere of the house changed. The sound of his voice, his presence, <laughs> my mother's contentment. Everything changed when my father came into the house. All of history changed when God became flesh, entered the world, and walked on our earth. Ever since Jesus has been on this earth, history has been different. God is in our house. We know that and we can hear his voice and we can sense his presence. And thanks to the teachings of the New Testament, we have access to the great promises of God as spoken and revealed through Jesus Christ. We see them in his teaching. We see them in his death, burial, and resurrection. We see His promises in the great coming of the Holy Spirit that changes the lives of those who give their hearts to God. We see His promises in the presence of the church and the promise of Christ's return. These great promises are the hope and the anchor points of the New Testament. As you dig into the New Testament under the guidance of my friend Randy Frazee, you're going to rediscover or perhaps discover for the first time these great promises awaiting you in the story of God. Our Father is in the house, and because He is, everything is different. This is your story, this is my story, but most of all, this is the greatest story ever told. This is God's story. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife.
In the lower story, we have a scandal on our hands. A young couple is engaged to be married, and out of nowhere, she ends up pregnant. Her fiancé is not the father. When word gets out in the little town of Nazareth, it's going to be big news. What's a man to do when he finds this out? Well, Joseph wasn't the angry, haughty type. He loved Mary and didn't want her to be the obstacle of the public gossip mill. So his best idea was to simply break off the engagement quietly and move on with his life. But in the upper story, God sees it differently. We don't have a scandal on our hands, but a solution. And not just any old solution to any old problem. This is the solution to the problem. God determined that he was going to provide a way to get us back. The baby in the womb of Mary is that way. God promised to use Abraham's offspring to be the blessing to all nations. The baby in Mary's womb is that solution. Both she and Joseph are offsprings of Abraham's seed. Joseph's plan makes great sense in the lower story, but it alters what God has in mind in the upper story. Time for an angel to have a chat with Joseph. As was common in the Old Testament, the angel appears to Joseph in a dream. Here's what the angel says. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. First, the angel reminds him that he is a son of David, He's not just an Israelite. He is from the tribe of Judah, the lineage of David. We are told clearly by God through the prophets that the Messiah would come from this family. Joseph qualifies. The angel tells him that the baby in Mary's womb did not come from the seed of another man. She did not have a scandalous affair. The seed came from the Holy Spirit. Now, why is this important? Well, it certainly had to be a great relief that Mary, his bride-to-be, didn't cheat on him. But there's more. Remember all the way back in chapter 1? We learned in the story of Cain and Abel that the sin nature is transmitted to all of Adam and Eve's offspring through the seed of the man. That is why starting over with Noah's family didn't work. While Noah was truly a righteous man, meaning he really did try hard to do what was right, he was a carrier of the virus. The one in the womb of Mary has not been conceived by the seed of the man, but of the Holy Spirit. This means that the sin nature has not been transmitted to the child in her womb. From the lower story, it looked like the baby would be conceived out of a sin. Now we learn from the upper story that he has been conceived without sin. This is big news. The angel instructs Joseph that the child is a boy, a divine sonogram, and that he is to name him Jesus. Jesus, essentially, is the name Joshua, which means in Hebrew, God saves. His name makes sense because that will be his mission. He will save the people from their sins. We don't know how Jesus will do this yet, but we know the outcome. The removal of sin in our lives that keeps us from a relationship with God. Everything since chapter 2 of the story has been pointing to this day. And 2,000 years later, it is finally here. God has kept his promise, even through all the mishaps of Israel along the way. We are then told that all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. What is happening to Mary was foretold by the prophet Isaiah 700 years earlier. This is the first of at least 47 quotations that Matthew takes from the Old Testament to refer to Jesus, the Messiah. Everything in the life and history of Israel has been pointing to Jesus' arrival. Everything. Now, another name that Jesus would be referred to is by the name Emmanuel. In Hebrew, this name literally means God with us. The baby growing in Mary's womb is none other than God himself. He is leaving the upper story and coming down to not only be with us in the lower story,
but to be one of us. That's what the word incarnation means, in flesh. God is coming down and taking up flesh to be among us. He is our representative. He has to come to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, to take away our sin that keeps us from God. Now, how would you like to wake up from a dream like that? Although Joseph likely had lots of questions swimming around in his head, like how does one go about parenting God? He made up his mind on what he was going to do. He calls Mary and gets together. You can imagine how nervous she must have been. Historians tell us that she was somewhere around 14 years old, maybe 16. What is Joseph going to do is Mary's primary concern. The ball is in his court. From the lower story perspective, he had good reason to be angry. Joseph tells her about his upper story encounter. He tells her he knows what's going on and how it's all going to happen. Then he grabs her by the hand and looks her square in the eye and says, if you're still willing, I would love to be your husband and we'll get through this together. Well, they get married and the baby Jesus grows in her belly. When, when Mary is about to term and ready to deliver, a very unfortunate and inconvenient requirement is laid upon them in the lower story. Caesar Augustus, emperor of Rome, required all people to travel to their own towns to be counted in a census. Mary and Joseph's hometown wasn't Nazareth, but Bethlehem. It'll take them three days on a donkey to make the trip. I'm sure that Mary's OBGYN told her that donkey travel this late in the pregnancy is forbidden, but she has no choice. Caesar ruled the lower story. They travel to Bethlehem, and wouldn't you know it, Mary goes into labor. The only place they could find to deliver God was a cave-like stable out behind one of the local Bethlehem inns. How unfortunate that the best we could do for the arrival of God to our world was a birth in a barn. I'm not, I'm not the only one who thinks that way. There's a story told of a school that planned a great Christmas pageant. All the important parts were given to the brightest students. The smartest girl was chosen to be Mary. The smartest boy was to play Joseph. The next smartest group played the three kings, the angels, and the shepherds. There was only one part no one wanted. It was the part of the innkeeper and it went to the least gifted student in the class. As the day approached, the boy playing the innkeeper began to worry. He couldn't imagine telling Mary and Joseph that there was no room in the inn. What was he going to do? Finally, it was curtain time. Parents, relatives, and friends packed the auditorium. They proudly watched the story unfold as their children played important roles. Meanwhile, the innkeeper grew more and more anxious the pressure mounted as Mary and Joseph approached. He didn't know what to do. When Mary and Joseph knocked, suddenly he threw open the door and exclaimed, Come on in. I've been expecting you. With that, the crowd cheered and clapped, and the play came to an end. But in the upper story, this is exactly what they had in mind. To fulfill the prophecy, Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem in humble circumstances. You know, Caesar thought he was in charge of the world. God is in charge, interceding in something, in something as benign as a census to bring about his upper story plan. Now the arrival of Jesus is going to change everything. We'll see this in the chapters to come. But right now, I want to make an observation. Later in the story, we are told over and over again that when we accept Jesus as our Savior, the forgiver of our sins, he comes into us like he came into Mary. Not into our womb, but into our lives. And just like in Mary's case, as Jesus grew in her, he just had to eventually come out. The same is true of us today. As Jesus' life grows in us, he will eventually come out of us as well for people to see. And we want all the people in our lives to see Jesus because his birth is not the result of a scandal, but a solution to our scandal to our sin. This should cause us to shout out the same words of the heavenly host upon seeing Jesus. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Come on.
on in. <laughs> what, uh, what did you hear there that surprised you or impressed you? You know, I thank you for pointing that out. I mean, how Jesus comes in us and then eventually he comes out of us. And it is, I, I am so taken, it's been so heavy on my heart here, how, how we have created a, a culture of Christians in many cases where the, the end game is come to church. Come to church and, and, and let Jesus be poured into you. Well, that's, that's wonderful, except there's another piece there. Because if we're just being poured into, we're not, we're not part of God's solution for the world. I mean, it's wonderful to be poured into, but eventually, if, you're, if he's not coming out of you, you're missing something. And I'm, I'm just really increasingly taken with how so many Christians kind of come to the same sanctuary and I'm good, pour into me. And they go home and they, they really don't have a, they don't know what to do. They don't, I mean, that's, that's irrelevant. What happens out there is irrelevant because this is where, this is where I go. So, yes, I, I thought that was really wonderful to, to hear, hear talk it, give us that challenge. What does it mean for Jesus to come out of us? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, that, that's the question. Yeah, I mean, Yeah, it's, it's, it's how we live, it's how we say, it's what we do, it's how we treat people, it's how we serve. What else? What else impressed any, anybody? You hear the doctrine of, of, of sin, how sin's passed on? I ne I'd never heard that, but right, I heard that before, but I never looked into that. I, I tried to look into that, and I, I, I could not really find that as a standard theological belief that sin is transferred through the man and not the woman, and therefore, I think that is just another explanation for Jesus' sinlessness, because he came from a sinful mother. So she was sinful, but she didn't seem to have, that doctrine is not commonly held that it came through the man. It's, I just couldn't find that really. But they didn't say it came from the man. They said that it came from the Holy Spirit. So that's why there was no sin that got planted into her. They didn't say that that it was from from Joseph. Yeah, what he said was, uh, because sin is passed on through the man, through the DNA of the man, and since there was no DNA from the man, the DNA was from the Holy Spirit, that, that, that therefore sin was not passed on to Jesus. So it's just, it's another way of, of the, the Catholic Church came up with Immaculate Conception. This is another explanation for how, and I think going back to, I think what you said, I mean, was that there's a mystery. We don't know how Jesus was born with how any sin that he was, and that's what's really important. That, that's what's really essential. Anything else in that? Capture your, capture your question? So essentially, Mary was God's surrogate. <laughs> Mary was God's surrogate, yes. She, got, she didn't pay, pay $30,000 or anything. She just did it. <laughs> <laughs> and she was 14 years old. Yeah, that's good. That would go over today. How does John describe Jesus in his opening chapter? He calls him Jesus the King. He calls Jesus the Word. He calls Jesus the Messiah. All of the above. The Word. In the beginning it was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God. First John. Jesus is the Word. When Joseph discovered Mary was pregnant, what was his initial plan? A, to, he planned to divorce her. B, he determined to find the guy responsible. C, he decided to bring her before the priests for punishment. Or D, he immediately began to defend his own name within his family. A, A. he was going to divorce her, right? How many wise men from the east came to worship Jesus? Two, three, four? The Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say. Uh, no. There were three gifts, we know, mm -hmm. but it could have been 20 guys, as far as we know. 
When Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem at age 12, what was he doing? A, he was staying with relatives for a festival. B, he was with the authorities because he had been left behind. C, he was talking with teachers in the temple. Or D, he was playing hide and seek. <coughs> yes, he was talking with the teachers in the temple. Kind of remarkable, 12 year old kid, not even bar mitzvahed yet. <laughs> Telling them, the priests and the leaders, <coughs> what they should be doing. And going to page uh, 189. The first fill in, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. sins. Their sins. When, when we learn from the upper story that he has been conceived without, without sin. Emmanuel means God yes. with us. And who ruled the lower story? Caesar. Caesar. And his birth is not the result of a scandal, but a blank. Solution. It's a great phrase. It is a solution to our scandal. And we just love to have our own sense of scandal, doesn't it? Back to page 186. What are, number three, what are the roles of angels in the lower story? <clears throat> What's that? To reassure and provide guidance to their children. Announcing. To announce. And angel means what? Messenger. Messenger. Who are the answer ladies tonight? They were messengers? What, what else? What's a heavenly host? Angels. Sometimes I, 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 want, I want to direct this in a children's pattern and, and have, you know, have them read the story from, I think it's Matthew. And, and the angels came and the heavenly host, and you know, they have these kids in white robes and they have, you know, little wire, little, uh, little uh, what you call it, up here, and yeah, they're all cute. I want these kids to come up in their fatigues and their M M40, their, their, uh, their machine guns. Freak the parents out. Of course, that will be my last Christmas at that church. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly host were the kick butt military guys. Yeah, these are these are fearsome, protective, <clears throat> dangerous angels. And they are there to say, this is the real thing, and that's our guys. Don't don't mess with him. Huh. It's not a happy little pretty. It's really serious. What's that? They're not the party givers. They're, no, they're not. The, they're, they're not. Hey, I've got to some cookies and punch. This is, these are the angels that were sent out when Santa Crab was a, had 185 or had you know a zillion soldiers and 185,000. I think it was died that night because they were surrounding Jerusalem. These are these are the angels that that do damage. And, uh, so angels, yeah, they were messengers, they were reassurers, and they were, they were the ones you just took very seriously. I kind of like seeing that side of God as well. I think we, we there's, a, there's a book I have called The Domestication of God. You know, in so many ways we have made him a little lap dog that's comfortable and cute and loving. And he might bite you, but, you know, he's, I got him handled. We don't got him handle. I wrote down here, how is it different for us with dad in the house? I love the Max Lucado's little story there. How is it different with dad in the house? What does that mean? No messing around. Well, safe. Secure, safety. Yeah, we feel there's there's a sense of safety and security. The family's complete. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> what, was, what was that? Go ahead, Lori. 
Somebody to mow the grass. <laughs> <laughs> no. Somebody will take care of business now. Yeah. That's a... I don't know. I know a lot of moms that can take care of business. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dad's having a unique role in the, in the world. Moms can do a lot of things, too. Dads do have a unique A different atmosphere when, when God is present in my home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have a, page 187, uh, did you have a, a, a new discovery from your reading and study this week? Who had one that, that came up? You, you wrote in your book, which I'm impressed with, because I did it, but did you have one? Well, I actually didn't have it there. I thought it was there with Ray Weidman. Oh. I just didn't know that he wasn't going to Yeah, I saved that motion. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you thought there were three wise men? Yeah. yeah. Well, we sing about them, don't we? I mean, these images are imprinted on our brains. Yeah, 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 yeah right. <laughs> right. It's that whole Christmas thing, you know, that it's, uh, it's not all true. You know, that we learn as children. The Christmas in the tree and all that stuff. It's not about that. It's a wonderful mythology. I mean, it's charming and it's fun and it's romanticized and it's glorious and it's got Christian stuff in it, but there is a lot of mythology there. Yeah, there's a lot to do with nothing about what's really going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate. It's, it's become Xmas, as I've talked about. Um, and but when did the wise men come? Yeah, remember um, uh, Christmas. Yeah, after they were eight for Christmas. Yeah, they came to probably probably two years later. It's probably one to two years later. Remember, Herod had all those kids killed. They, were, they weren't you know, twenty days old. They were two years old. So, yeah. anybody else have a, a learning from from this chapter? Yeah, the Immaculate Conception. Again, you know, my, 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 my good buddy Ben, who, who, who got me through seminary in Greek and Hebrew, um, just, and a very, very learned theologian. I uh, loved Ben. He died in my last year. Ben, uh, ben, uh, ben was amazed at that. He didn't know that either. So I mean, there are some really smart theologians out there who, who never heard the Immaculate Conception had more had to do with Mary, not Jesus. Anything else? That, uh, this story is a pretty solid story. Most of you, most of you know it. Good. Well, you know what I want to try to do is, is take something that you might know a little bit about and see if I can expand on it. It's good for me. I dig into it. I learn some things. Well, so I'm glad you, glad you like it because it takes me some time to do that. I, I, I love doing it. Um, yeah, and if, and if I'm not, if it's not making a difference, then I shouldn't. I got other things I can spend time on. So I'm glad even that that was good for you. Well, next week we're going to continue in our next chapter. I forget the, the pages are. You probably got them there. If you've got your, your Bible. But the, gosh, these chapters take 20 minutes to read. It's just really amazing how. I just am really loving how easy it is to walk through the whole Bible. So if you have anybody you want to bring in, this is a good time because we're starting to do the New Testament. Any other questions? Any other thoughts you'd like to in the last two or three minutes? If maybe when you can repeat.